Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Well, this is by, I heard by your request that you wanted to hear about shingles and the new shingles shot, and I thought we couldn't spend a whole hour and a half on that, so I expanded it to all the vaccines that, might, that you might be interested in for you or for children or grandchildren that you also see and take care of. And um, this is an exciting time. We've just gone through a huge H1N1 epidemic, and everyone says, oh, it was nothing, but I think the reason that it was really relatively nothing was that we got the immunizations out early and we got people immunized. So this year the flu shot also has H1N1 in it and we'll talk about that too. And now we're coming out with some other epidemics and those are in my slides. So let's go. Well first, why do you think vaccines are important? There's several different kinds of prevention. There's primary prevention. And what primary prevention does is it removes or reduces the disease risk factors. And, and that's what immunizations are, is they are primary prevention. You don't have the disease, whereas secondary prevention is when someone has the disease and you want to stop the spread of it, and it promotes early detection, such as breast cancer and mammograms. Those are actually secondary detention not, uh, prevention, not primary. It doesn't, a mammogram does not stop you from having breast cancer. What a mammogram does is it finds the, the breast cancer when it's early and more treatable, we think. And then there's tertiary prevention, which is when you have the established disease and you can do some interventions to make it less hard, such as chronic disease and diabetes. You know, in, in diabetes management, we give people more than just things that lower their blood sugar. We also lower their cholesterol. We make sure that their blood pressure stays under control because we're trying to prevent things that are associated with diabetes. So what we're trying to do is manage the impact of diabetes and, and heart disease is what goes along with that. But for the bang for the buck, primary prevention is actually the way to go because it promotes the best opportunity for improving your health and for lowering health care costs. A $20 vaccine prevents a five-day stay in the hospital with pneumonia. It's a pretty good bang. So this is the immunization schedule for adults. You don't have to memorize it. We're going to go through each of the vaccines, but I just wanted to show you how it, how it does look. And I'm going to start at the top and go down to the bottom. And the handouts that you got are going to be in that order, too. Instead of producing all the slides that we're going to use, I thought, why not just put the ones down with the vaccine we're talking about, and then you can put down the notes that you want to know about that vaccine. So how do immunizations work? Well, they induce what's called active immunity. So they stimulate your own immune system to develop an antibody to that particular infection. And how do they do that? Well, they make the vaccine up of several different things. They can make it up of the killed bacteria. They could make it up of the live attenuated bacteria and that the bacteria has been bred and manipulated so it does not cause the specific disease anymore, but it's still so similar to the disease that the body develops antibodies to both, to the natural occurring and the attenuated or substances in the organism, such as uh, viral particles and capsions, things like that. And then 
you also can have immunizations against things that the bacteria makes, like the toxoids that they make. The, the bacteria secretes a substance, and so instead of making the antibody to the bacteria, you make the antibody to the substance that is secreted by the bacteria. So let's talk about excuses. Why don't we get vaccinated? Well, say you have a mild in illness. I'm sick, I shouldn't have my vaccine today. Well, if you just have a low grade fever or you just have a runny nose, that really doesn't stop us from immunizing. And we really carry this idea over to the children so that we make sure that our children get immunized. And so if they come in with, a, I mean, you know, up till age six, they have a runny nose about 50% of the time. So we immunize them anyway. And another excuse that people give is that they just finished antibiotics. So they were just on antibiotics. Guess what? Antibiotics do not affect your immunity. So that's not really a good excuse either. Or you get a tenderness or, or a small tenderness local reaction to the vaccine previously and you don't want to have a sore arm. You are going to get a little bit of soreness in some of these. You're injecting foreign, foreign body and you know, foreign particles into your body. So everyone's going to have a local reaction of some kind. And in fact, I worry about the ones that never have a reaction because that's showing that your body recognizes it as a foreign substance and is fighting it. So I, I think a, a reaction is a good thing. It shows that the vaccine actually took. Or a personal history of allergies, except eggs. Eggs, you, can't, you really can't have some vaccines if you are allergic to eggs because the vaccines are grown on, on eggs. And a family history of adverse reactions. Well, my mother didn't react very well to this or that vaccine, therefore I'm never going to take it. Not good enough excuse either. But there are certain things that we really have to be careful of when we immunize people. And one of them is if when you got a shot the last time you had difficulty breathing, you know, collapsed, unconscious, then I don't think we're going to give you another vaccine. We'll say that was it. Um, and then the eggs again, like we talked about. And then there's also some of the viruses are grown on neomycin or streptomycin. So if you've had those antibiotics for some reason, and they're found in things like uh, eardrops. So you had an ear infection, you used a, a suspension of some kind to make it go away, and you got a huge big red swollen ear afterwards. That means you were probably sensitive to that uh, neomycin in the antibiotic. And then if you're immunocompromised, we have to be really careful. Now, what does that big word immunocompromised mean? It means that your immune system doesn't work very well. And that can be because one, it's being toned down by being given some, some uh, steroids, corticosteroids, for things like rheumatoid arthritis. Those are, we use, or asthma. Uh, we use those COPD. We use these things to calm down your own immune response because you are overreacting to things in those kinds of conditions. But it also blunts your response to if we put in foreign substances in you too. So that has to be evaluated on an individual basis. And there are some vaccines that you won't get and some that you will get. Because remember, we're talking about healthy adults here. And then household uh, members of, if you have someone very sick in your household that has like a, lymph, uh, a lymphatic cancer and they don't fight infection very well, then uh, we would probably not immunize you with some things too, so that you would not accidentally spread that particular immunization to the person you're caring for. And then also during pregnancy, same thing, except you're carrying around that, that little thing in, inside you. So in pregnancy, we also have special concerns about certain immunizations. So these are the things we have to ask about, have to know before we give shots. So let's talk about the first one. It's called the Tdap, T-D-A-P. Old, it's an old immunization. We've given it for years to children. Children have had it at, at uh, two, four, and six months. Then we give a booster at 18 months. Then we give them another booster before we, they start school, give them another booster when they go to junior high. And that's when we stopped giving the Tdap and we started giving uh, just tetanus updates. So let's talk about tetanus first. Well, tetanus is a vaccine that's formed by the bacterial toxoid. The Clostridium tetany bacteria makes it. And there have been all of 43 cases this year. And that's a, a decrease of 25% since 1908. So it doesn't sound like it's a big problem, does it? I mean, 25, you know, 
43 cases. However, people over age 60 are at highest risk because they don't seem to get their booster shots. And this is a totally preventable disease. And it's a very cheap shot. So that's why when people cut themselves or scrape themselves, get a you know, nail puncture wound, they go to the emergency room, they get a tetanus shot. And only 31% of people over age 70 do have protective levels of tetanus now because they don't get immunized. And the major cause of getting the tetanus in you is an acute injury. So this is very important in our military personnel. And everyone going overseas or fighting in Afghanistan or Iraq now certainly has an updated tetanus uh, with a lot of other shots that they've gotten. So what is tetanus disease? Well, as we said, it's a wound contamination by this bacteria called Clostridium tetany. And the family of bacteria called Clostridium, you might have heard from like Clostridium botulinum. That's caused by a similar organism. And it's the same thing. They produce an exotoxin. It isn't the bacteria, but it's the subject that they make that kills you. Because this is a neurotoxin. And um, the Clostridium organism is kind of interesting. It has uh, a thick cell wall like a plant. So they're, you know, some people, they, they say it's one of the earliest animal bacteria there is because it's so close to being a plant. And the early signs of this is, this is locked jaw. So the earliest signs after you get infected are jaw stiffness, neck spasms. So you could certainly dismiss this. You know, oh, you know, a little stiff today. Mm, just take an aspirin, get better. And it can progress then to uh, convulsions and death, and especially in the over 60 crowd. So the recommendation is that you get your updated tetanus every 10 years. So you can put that on the thing. Check when I had my last tetanus shot. So what about diphtheria? That's the D part of DTAP. In the children's vaccine, the D is a big D because it's a more, more amount of diphtheria than there is in the adult vaccine or the ones given to people over age six. And this also is a bacterial toxoid. And, um, because we've used it so much in combination with the tetanus shot, there is a lot of herd immunity to diphtheria. And that's why you don't see many cases of it anymore. And herd immunity means that if you're not immunized, but everyone around you is immunized, and you're in the middle of the circle, you won't get infected, because they have to go through these people who already have been immunized first. The most at risk are the uh, people who aren't fully immunized against diphtheria, because it did take three doses of shots as a baby to get your primary series up, and then the booster. And so these are usually um, travelers like to endemic areas where, where diphtheria is more prevalent than it is here. And what about the disease? It's caused by this bacteria called Carinibacterium diphtheriae. It attacks the respiratory tract. But it can go to any mucous membrane. It doesn't have. It just has to be a mucous membrane. Excuse me for a second. Mm -hmm. And um, it also produces an exotoxin. It uh, can cause myocarditis. It can cause heart failure. So the bacteria comes into your mucous membrane, and then it starts making the exotoxin, which goes in your bloodstream, can go to your heart, can damage your heart, it can damage your nerves. So that after a diphtheria infection, you might have a limp, you might not be able to have sensation in one extremity, depending on what part of the brain is affected by the neurotoxin. And I just wanted to put that down. It inhibits this thing that, that you need for protein synthesis in the nerve cells. So in other words, the neurotoxin would be much more toxic to people who are younger and still making a lot of proteins than people who are older. But it would still affect anything that you regenerate. The most common infection is the pharyngeal, the pharynx, and it forms this thick gray membrane over the tonsils that you literally have to cut out because the patient can't breathe. And my uh, whooping cough, big one. Whooping, it's a cough caused by uh, Bordetella pertussis is the name of the organism that causes it. And it's an infection that starts with a cold and with malaise and a cough. You can have that for two weeks. So you can be wandering around with just a cold and not know about it. 
and come in and then you start getting this whooping cough. And when they say a paroxysmal cough, there's even a website you can go to about whoopingcough.com where you can hear what the whooper cough is. But it, it's, it's going, it goes <laughs> that kind of thing. So it's inhaling rather than the exhaling cough. And the thing on the, on the white count, the CBC, which is a blood test, the complete blood count, which you measure your hemoglobin and your white cells, it shows what's called the lymphocytosis. Uh, well, this is difficult for us as doctors because we see someone that comes in with a mild cold, but we're concerned enough that we draw a blood test, and the blood test is consistent with a virus because lymphocytes go up with viral infections. So we'll just tell the person, oh, it's probably a cold, not whooping cough. And so we won't treat it early enough. And so th the problem with that, according, and this quote came right from the uh, Department of Public Health, California Department of Public Health, and that lack of good diagnostic tests and specific clinical presentations leads one to conclude that immunization is the best strategy to control pertussis in adults. So what about this pertussis vaccine? Well, we know it's only included in the TDAP. AP stands for acellular pertussis. The vaccines that you probably got as children were not the acellular kind. They, and people got a lot more reactions. People got encephal, you know, kids got encephalitis from it. But now what they've done is they've purified the bacteria a little bit so that we still develop immunity, but we don't get an overreaction to, to the uh, acellular vaccine. And there's a large reservoir of disease out there. This is not something that you can get rid of easily either. So most at risk are the children under two who haven't had that series of immunizations yet. They haven't had their, their three series of shots. And so the, uh, California has now had at least eight fatalities of infants this year alone from pertussis. And this is really one of the main reasons I wanted to expand this talk to all vaccines instead of just the, the shingles vaccine. So here's what pertussis cases looked like reported in California from 1950 till present. You can see we had a nice low time and all of a sudden we're starting to get this upswing again. And this is what the uh, California Public Health Service says, that there were 3,311 cases. That's a lot. That's not just 43 tetanus cases. And a seven-fold increase from previously. And the problem is, is that there were eight infant deaths. Seven of them were under three months, and so they weren't immunized. They didn't have any immunization at all. And the other one was a preemie, who also was not completely immunized. And where did these kids get the vaccine, get the disease? They probably got them from their parents or sibs. Because, you know, new babies don't get, va don't get sick unless they're exposed to it somewhere. Completely treatable disease. And then here's the cases, just to show you where they, they congregate over the state. And you can see Alameda County is pretty bad. I mean, it's, it's uh, orange, almost up there. So what are the new recommendations for adult D Tdap? All adults from 19 to 64 years of age need a booster shot. Women of childbearing age need a booster shot. Postpartum women, if they are not fully immunized, need a booster shot. So I hope you all have had your booster shots. You can get them free in the public health department. Don't even have to go to your doctor. This is such an overwhelming epidemic. And I think for people who, have, who are exposed to any child under age two, they should seriously think about making sure they have their booster shot up to date. We've currently changed the recommendation even in the emergency room. When someone comes in with a serious wound, they don't get just a tetanus shot they get this booster TDAP now because of this epidemic. So now we're going to talk about something called human papillovirus. Human papillovirus vaccine, there are two of them, just to let you know. And the only reason that you're supposed to know is that if you have a child who gets this vaccine, you should really make sure you know what kind it is that they got, not that they just got the vaccine. 
um, it's human papillaviruses is sexually transmitted. And we think it's a major risk factor for cervical cancer. Therefore, right now we immunize girl children around age 12. And they get uh, 100, they get three shots over a six month, peri six month period. Nearly 100% of women with cervical cancer were infected with HPV. This was something that was discovered on routine pap smears and tracking it back, they found that this was a virus that's associated with cancer. You know, they've, they found that in the animal kingdom, but I think this is the first evidence in the human kingdom that viruses can be associated with cancer and might even turn on cancer genes. So there's 15 different human papillovirus subtypes, but 16 and 18 are the two major ones, which is why that one vaccine just has the 16 and 18 in it. The other one has, has the other two in it too. And we start at age 12, but we give any woman up to, up to age 27 the vaccine if they've not had the series. And even sexually active women who are already positive for HPV should get this vaccine. And the, the reason they should get it is that they will be then immunized against the other strains. And when they're HPV positive, we, don't, we usually find that on a pap smear, and that does not usually tell us serotyping what strain it is that they're positive to. They're just positive. So we don't know if they're the HPV positive for cancer or not. And that's why they should have their immunization if they're under age 27. And then now people are making noises saying that it should be given to the men to prevent vac uh, venereal warts. Nose thing out. So chickenpox, we're almost at zoster. Varicella chickenpox used to be the disease of childhood, right? And all adults with no immunity to varicella never had chickenpox. They need to get two shots of this vaccine so that they can be immune to chickenpox. And there are severe complications of this infection, and especially if you're, if you're older or younger. The very young and the very old are the ones who fare worse because they can get pneumonia and encephalitis from the chickenpox virus. Childbearing age women, we need to check their immunity. The reason is if they are not immune and they get pregnant and they're ready to deliver, then they're exposed to chickenpox, they expose their, their baby with no immunity to the disease. And there's nothing we can do except support the baby if he gets the disease. And that's why all healthcare workers get checked for this too, to make sure that we're not going to expose, you know, people in the hospital who can't fight the disease, expose them to this disease either. So who could have immunity? You have to document two cases of the vaccine. You can see they're pretty strict on this because of the problem with the perinatal period. And U.S. born citizens, if they were born before 1980, we assume that they probably had chickenpox. History of chickenpox disease, history of shingles, because as we're gonna find out later, shingles is just the sequelae to chickenpox. And laboratory confirmation of immunity. A simple test of your blood serum can tell if you're immune to chickenpox or not. How does chickenpox look? I just saw a case uh, six months ago of chickenpox. They came from a foreign country into my office visiting relatives who had babies who had not been immunized yet. And uh, they did bring chickenpox into the country that way because it's a 14 to 21 day incubation period. So, you know, they came in on day seven of their incubation period with no symptoms. So they just came in, were visiting friends, visiting relatives, and they had it. And then you get the fever and the malaise, you feel tired, Sim simple viral infection, because chickenpox is a virus. And they describe the, the vesicles of chickenpox as a rose petal or dewdrop. These are the things I have to listen to in medical school. Like I know what a dewdrop looks like on, a, on the skin, but it's really just a clear bump, that's all it is. A clear bump on the skin, we call that a vesicle because it's bumped up and it has clear fluid inside it. It's very contagious. When this person came into our office, we thought he might have chicken pox, so immediately he was put into an isolation room. And immediately after he left, that room was not used all day. It was wiped down with Clorox. We had to wait and wait and wait to make sure that we weren't going to spread that virus to other people who weren't immunized. 
complications of chickenpox in kids, especially the secondary infection, because it's very itchy, so they scratch and, and get a secondary infection in the skin lesions, which then scar. And uh, you can have, it can also affect the heart and the kidneys and pneumonia. And pneumonia progressing to adult respiratory distress syndrome, that's what ARDS stands for, and then encephalitis. They, they get a little confused, they get delirium, don't know where they are. That's the virus affecting their brain. So what are the consequences of chickenpox? One in a thousand adults will get encephalitis. That's a pretty high statistic. 10% of them will die. So of the one in a thousand, 10% of those will die. And then after the primary infection, we can't kill viruses, just like HPV virus. We cannot kill it. We can only develop, make sure we have immunity so when it does come out from where it's hiding, that we attack it right away before it starts making more virus. So this sneaky little chickenpox virus hides in your nerve cells. And so it stays either in the cranial nerves or the rest of the body nerve cells. And it doesn't hide in all the nerve cells. It hides in a particular nerve cell, you know, one or two or three of them right together. Because your body's pretty good at getting rid of this, of killing it when it's replicating. But it doesn't kill it when it's just hiding and not growing. And so this is the other thing that now that we call it chickenpox virus, it now has a lot of other names. And we have to remember it's a herpes virus, just like herpes papilloma virus, which causes cancer. So herpes viruses are pretty deadly to us. Cold sores are herpes virus. If you, ever, you remember the cold sores that you get on your lips? That's another herpes virus. And so this one is called the herpes virus number three. It's also called varicella zoster virus. So a combination of names, but it's still the same virus. And when it is reactivated, when something happens that it gets activated into the, from the nerve cells, what happens? You get shingles. So if you've had the chicken pox, you have this virus inside of you. It's hiding, waiting to come out. So what are shingles? They're a vesicular eruption, like chicken pox, but then in a very localized area, and they crawl right along the nerve endings. So this virus comes out, it hides at the beginning of the nerve, and it crawls along to the end of the nerve. And that's why uh, only people who have had chicken pox can get shingles. And it comes from the Latin word cingulum, which means a belt or a girdle, because dermatomes of our body, one little nerve lining, are like a belt. It's usually on one side because it doesn't affect the other side, and it goes from the back to the front. And usually the vesicles come out that way too as it's crawling along the nerve, from the nerve in your spine all the way out along your chest or your buttocks, Usually it doesn't go to the, I, I don't see many on the arms or the feet. It's usually the trunk or the cranial nerves. The worst one, of course, is the ophthalmic, where it can affect the eye. What's the annual incidence? Bigger than 43 cases. Annual incidence of shingles in the US is 1 million. And about 20% will get shingles in their lifetime, 20% of all people. And one in three of that 20% will get it between, in the ages of 60 to 80. So that is why, well, we'll go further. That's why the vaccine is recommended for that age group. So if you had chickenpox, you are susceptible to shingles because the virus is still in you. So signs of shingles. You get a mild fever and malaise. Don't feel well. Maybe you're coming down with a virus, feeling a little back, back pain. Then you start developing severe lancing pain in a particular area, that particular belt, that particular girdle, one particular side, not the other, and it stays in that location. It doesn't move around. And then the rash appears. And it appears usually from the back to the front because that's the way the nerve goes. 
and it's not considered contagious as shingles, but if there is virus in those vesicles, so if you are exposed to, if you're if those vesicles are open and that particular fluid is exposed to someone who does not, who has not had chickenpox, they can get the disease. So remember that if you're visiting children, grandchildren who haven't had chickenpox. Or someone who's immunocompromised, such as you're going to visit a friend who, who has, uh, you know, a really bad cancer. It's probably not the right time to do it. So what are the complications of shingles? Well, you can get the skin infections, just like you can with chickenpox. You can also get eye complications if it affects the ophthalmic branch. It can actually go into the cornea of the eye and damage the cornea, as well as going to the back of the eye if it's the ocular motor nerves and, and go, go to the retina, the seeing part of the eye. So it can cause blindness. It can cause ear inflammation and, and facial weakness if it affects the lower branches of the cranial nerve that innervates your face. Then there's that post-herpatic neuralgia, PHN. This is the one that most people know about. This is where the pain persists even after the vesicles are gone. So that severe lancing pain is still present. Even though the vesicles are gone, supposedly the virus has gone back into its dormant state. This is the most common complication of shingles, and it can affect 10 to 15 percent of all the patients who get shingles. So that means of the 1 million people who get shingles annually, 100,000 to 150,000 of those will be suffering from this post-herpetic neuralgia. And if the age is over 60, you have a 60 to 70 percent chance of getting post-herpetic neuralgia. It's mild to severe pain. And because these statistics came from things like if you still have a little tingling left from having had the shingles, that's still post-herpetic neuralgia, even though it's really not incapacitating, it's just irritating, to severe lancing pain, which is incapacitating. And the pain can persist for months or years. Usually we, we try different things for pain relief, you know, the, the opioids, or we try these new, newer pain thing for pain relief, like uh, they call them disease modulators, such as, uh, I don't want to use brand names, gabapentin uh, would be one. And then there's some newer antidepressants that you could use for those too. And they work in some people, but not all people. But the disease usually burns out over time. Just like, you know, when, when you were a kid, you probably got more, you know, bigger cold sores, more cold sores than you get now that you're older. You might get a little bit or a little swelling now, but you usually don't get the full-blown big herpes that you used to get when you were in grade school. So we've got shingles prevention. Guess what it is? If you, were in, if you had chickenpox and the herpes virus is dormant, just again. And what happens is because the herpes virus has not been exposed to your immune cells, because it's been hiding all this time, your immune cells thinks that it doesn't need to remember about this infection. And so you lose the memory of the antibody that you need to fight these cells over time. It's kind of like you have some old files around and you don't have them in your file cabinet. So you just, you purge them, right? Rip them up. Well, unfortunately, the problem is still there. So, but you didn't know that. Your body didn't know that. So then, if you're exposed to a child with chickenpox, then your immunity is boosted. And so before we had the chickenpox vaccine, pa parents used to get re-exposed to chickenpox you know, when it, with their children. So shingles wasn't as big a problem as it was you know, back then as it is now that we have the chickenpox vaccine, because we don't see chickenpox anymore. Kids don't get chickenpox. So now we have this zoster vaccine which is the same one, it's given sub-Q in the deltoid area. It must be given sub-Q because it's a live vaccine. Live vaccines are given under the skin, you know, killed vaccines are given in the muscle. That's the difference. And uh, people between the ages of 60 and 80 are targeted for this. Does that mean if you're over age 80 that you should not have the vaccine? I think that's something you need to talk to your doctor about. Medicare won't pay for it because this is the indication and this is where all the research is done. But if you're a healthy 81-year-old, you know, you can decide that yourself. And you don't give this with other live vaccines. So if someone comes in and says, I want an update of all my vaccines, I'm 60 years old, you know, blah, blah, blah. 
you still would not give them this live vaccine with another because this vaccine is four times stronger than the regular varicella vaccine that we give children. That's the difference of this vaccine. You also have to stop any antiviral drugs. You know, suppose you take, take uh, acyclovir, something for cold sores or genital warts. You, you have to stop that or what happens is you never develop an immunity to the shot that you got. And you, you can take the vaccine even if you've had a course of shingles because remember that virus is still in you and we want to potentiate your immunity to the disease even if you're in a nursing home. And even if you have chronic medical conditions, you still can take this vaccine. But you can't take it because remember the contraindications to live vaccines. You can't take it if you're sensitive to what the vaccine grew on, the neomycin. You can't take it if you have, you know, a lymphoma, a neoplasm that affects your immune response because even though it's live and it's even though it's attenuated, it's still live and it can still grow in you. So that's why you still have to have an intact immune system to take it. And then one of the contraindications is pregnancy, but I, I was wondering how many people age 60 get pregnant, you know? So that's why I put it on there. And, and if you're taking high dose steroids, you don't take it either for the same reason. Your immune response is, is dropped. Now, what is high dose steroids? Well, you can talk to your doctor about that, but usually it's uh, over 10 milligrams of prednisone a day. It's called high dose. And, or you're being treated for active TB right now because there you need to fight that disease. You can't give yourself another live virus to fight at the same time. It will, the TB will actually grow. MMR. You guys getting tired yet? No. Now you heard that you heard about zoster. We can all go home now. Measles, mumps, rubella. Measles. These are the live attenuated measles vaccine. It was introduced in 1967. I just thought this 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 data was really interesting because it does explain how much bang we get out of primary prevention by using immunizations. Because by '85, it prevented 5.2 million cases of measles. I mean, that's staggering. And the thing that I thought was really interesting is that is it prevented 17,000 cases of mental retardation that these patients would have gotten. And this is all extrapolated based on previous data. Um, by 91, what happened is it got introduced in 67, but by 1991, there seemed to be an uptick of, of uh, measles again. So they thought that probably the immunity was waning. And that's why we have this booster shot of measles, mumps, rubella that we give kids at age we give them after age one year, and then we give it to them at age five years. Now, we don't know if that lasts a lifetime yet or not, because it's only since, what, 1991 that we've been doing the booster dose. So we'll have to keep our eyes open and see what happens. But indigenous measles is rare in this country. The cases, the last outbreak of measles came from people from, that came to San Diego from Switzerland where they don't immunize against measles. And, uh, but imported cases so are a serious problem, and you do want to check for immunity. Now, what about mumps? Mumps is kind of interesting. It's a live virus vaccine. It was also introduced in 67 at the same time. And, and the thing about mumps, it also resurged, so they thought that add it to the booster. It resurged again in 2006, and, um, but those were in people that didn't seem to be completely immunized, so they discounted it a little bit. With, mu with mumps, the serious complications are neurologic. It can affect the nerves as, a, as viruses do. It can affect the testicles and it can cause uh, an inflammation in the testicles. I saw, um, when I was in the military, I saw the neurosurgeon got mumps from one of his kids. Yeah, <laughs> and this poor big guy was lying in bed and his testicles were that big. It was just awful, I felt so sorry for him. Um, and then I think I had, I had mumps like around four times when I was in school. I mean, so it's a very hard disease to keep immunity up. That's the thing with mumps. And I think we had some cases coming out of Ohio a couple of years ago too. Same problem, and that, the immunity waned. So, but this is the serious one, rubella. This is the German or the three-day measles. In, uh, it, in 1969, there were 57,000 cases. In 1996, there were 213 cases. What do you think my next figure is going to be? 
Remember, no, but not everyone gets immunized. But that's a marked decrease. Eight. 2006, last place where we have complete information, there were eight documented cases of German measles. So I, I think this is a real win, too, to show people that immunizations work. Get your shots. The problem with, with the German measles is, I think the biggest problem is the congenital rubella syndrome. This is where the babe, a pregnant woman who does not have immunity to German measles or rubella gets the infection, and the fetus inside her ends up being born with all of these defects. Totally preventable disease. So again, healthcare workers have to have their rubella shots. We have to show proof of rubella immunity so we're not exposing people in the hospital. Um, we also on prenatal panels on women who get prenatal care, that's part of the panel that they get checked to see if they have rubella or not, a rubella titer. So if you aren't pregnant, the most serious problem with the vaccine is that you get joint tenderness and a mild rash. I got both of those. They were, it was awful. I went two weeks with having this big swollen red joints. People did not believe it was just the rubella vaccine, so they worked me up for all these other things that cause arthritis until I told them I got tired of it and so I had to get back to work. So who doesn't need the measles, mumps, rubella shot? Well, if you were born before 1957, you're considered immune. But if after 57, then you have to show proof of the disease. And it's pretty, you know, it's pretty onerous showing what you have to show. But that's because the diseases are so serious. So of course, healthcare workers, we have to show our proof of immunity, the childbearing age women, like we said. And um, for the measles and mumps, you need at least two doses of the vaccine to be fully immunized. One dose won't do it. Only one dose of rubella will do it, though. But since they're combined, we just give the two. Now, influenza. How many people got their flu shots? One. Oh, OK, seasonal flu. Acute respiratory illness caused by influenza A or B. Annual epidemic. It usually occurs in the winter months here or in you know, South America. It's their winter. It occurs there. So it usually goes to South America first and then comes up here. Uh, influenza virus uh, mutates every year. So you don't get the same virus. That's why we can't cure colds. The, the vi those viruses are sneaky. Not only do they hide in our body, but they actually cha they can change their genetic code. And so the CDC, which is the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, and my favorite website, cdc.gov, if you want to write that down, that's where you can check up on immunizations and, and really accurate information. And they'll also have maps that tell you, you know, where the outbreaks are. It's kind of fun to the, get the kids involved to look at that. Uh, in collaboration with the World Health Organization, they sit down and try to decide what particular strains are going to hit a particular country each year. And this year, we, they've included the H1N1 as one of the strains. That's one of the influenza A strains. And then they have another influenza A strain and then an influenza B. And the preparations, you, it needs to be IM. Because these are killed viruses, you're not getting the live vaccine. It does have to go into the muscle, not into the sub-Q. And it's uh, intranasal, though. We have the live vaccine, which is recommended for people up to from, from age two now. I give my, my little kids over age two, I ask them, do you want the shot or do you want me to put something in your nose? Oh, in, nose, nose. OK, you have to help. And they do great. They sniff it right up. They, they love it that they didn't get their shots. Um, and I think that the, actually the mist is better. It's not recommended over age 49 because it hasn't been tested in the older age groups. It uh, provides immunity to the mucous membranes, whereas the shot only provides immunity inside your body. So you can still have all the signs of the flu virus in your mucous membranes and your nose. So you can still get sick from the flu, but it's not going to progress as far as if you weren't vaccinated because you already have the antibody there just has to get mobilized. Whereas if you weren't vaccinated by the flu virus, you would have to go through the steps of recognizing the flu strain and then making an antibody and then finding the virus. And, and that's, why, that's why injections work, because it's kind of getting pre-prepared. You know, it's having that little kid all ready for you just in case you need it. So, 
And then there, this year, besides the, these two preps, there's a new prep out called the high dose influenza. And this has the same strains in it. It's recommended for anybody over age 65. What it has is four times the amount of, of influenza in it that the regular flu shot has. And you can talk to your doctor about if you should take that one or take the regular, you know, if you're over 65. I've been telling, I didn't know what the supply is of the high dose, so usually if my people are pretty healthy, I've been telling them 75. Because 65 to 75, most, most of them are really pretty healthy. I don't know if that's going to pan out or not, but I always hate the first year out of a vaccine. I'd like to see what happens, you know, when the first million people get it before I decide for sure. And then, of course, egg allergy is the only contraindication. The immunity lasts at least four months. They're thinking with the high dose, it's going to last longer than that. And remember, once you get the shot, it takes up to six weeks for you to develop your, your antibody and immunity to the flu, which is why they're making us give flu shots out earlier now. <laughs> yeah. So does it work? Does a flu shot really work? Well, it depends. It depends on if they guessed right about what to put in the flu shot. Because, you know, the virus, the virus migrates. It doesn't have to come here. Some other virus can come here. So it depends on if this is your first flu shot. Because sometimes the first flu shot isn't good enough for you. It's not high enough. So maybe if you've never had a flu shot and you're over 65, think about getting the high dose. Because you're, you're not going to have the really good immunity with just the first shot. And a lot of people I'll see in my office, if they have the first shot, they'll say, I got sick. And we'll go over it and try to talk them into it another year. A and C. And on, on mine, anyone, people in my office, if they're under age 65 and they don't want a flu shot, they don't have to have one, but I tell them I don't want to see them if they get sick because then they're going to get the flu shot next year. <laughs> More than 90% of influenza deaths occur in people over age 60. And these are usually people with comorbidities of diabetes or COPD or, you know, other problems besides just being healthy. And then one study on military recruits did show that they decreased hospitalizations and sick days and doctor visits. And this was a really good study. This wasn't, you know, someone just doing an observational study. It was tracked over three years. And so children, and a new study just came out last month about children with persistent asthma. And they, they've, they've done observational data on that. They've looked back at at records, you know, in emergency room visits and doctor visits. And they found in, in that meta-analysis that the flu shot actually did save hospitalizations and did save emergency room visits over, over kids who had asthma who didn't get the shot. So if you know of someone that isn't asthmatic and needs it, tell them, please go in and get it. Now, we, No, no, asthma kids do not get nasal. Because they have a hyper airway disease, that's what asthma is in children. And so that's one of the contraindications to the nasal vaccine is if you have asthma. Yeah. And also, if someone comes in and, and say they have a mild runny nose, you know, we can still immunize if they have a mild runny nose, no fever, but I won't give them the nasal one then either. They have to have the shot. Now, here's an important vaccine for anyone over age 50 the pneumococcal vaccine. What's really interesting is this was the first vaccine that was derived from a capsular polysaccharide. That means that the, the, the cell wall of this bacteria was made of a, of a sugar, complex sugar. And they made a vaccine to that cell wall back in 1945. I mean, that's a long time ago. And what happened? The, the powers that be said, oh, we've got penicillin. We don't need to vaccinate everybody against you know, these different kinds of pneumococcus, which are now strep. And look what happened. What do we have now? We've got severe bacterial immunity, and we've got really bad spreading strep infections, like you know, flesh-eating strep. So maybe that wasn't quite the right decision back then. And more people die of pneumococcal infections in the US than from any other vaccine-preventable death. Because remember, zoster, not that many people die from it. You're uncomfortable with that one million cases. But most of the time, you don't die. And what was tetanus, 43 cases? <laughs> so the infection is highest in children under 2 and in adults over age 65. So preventable disease, what do we do? 
Well, they did a meta-analysis. What a meta-analysis is, is they pool information from a lot of different sources all over the country. And they found that the pneumococcal vaccine protects against invasive pneumococcal disease. So it does not really protect you against getting the infection, but it protects you against that infection spreading to become all over your bloodstream or in other areas. And they found it was inconclusive if it protected against all, any, all causes of pneumonia. So it, it might even give you some protection against other pneumonias, because they couldn't say it ruled it out, that it didn't do it. They just couldn't prove that it did. And then they found no reduction in all-cause mortality. In other words, getting the vaccine doesn't decrease your risk of dying from a serious infection. But it does decrease your risk of the complications of this particular infection. So in 2005, 66% of people over age 65 were immunized. And this is the vaccine that is also paid for by Medicare. Zostrix is, not, is paid for under Part D Medicare, which is your drug benefit. And this one is paid for under Part B Medicare, your regular doctor visit, et cetera. And they recommend that it's a one-time dose for healthy adults over age 65. Now, we do give pneumococcal vaccine to to people at earlier ages, but we give it based on them being not healthy, such as they don't have a spleen, so they're more, much more at risk for these kinds of pneumonias, and they can't fight them very well. Or, as we said, immunocompromised people. So now, you guys are almost done. You've been really good. We're going to talk about travel. I had to show you my, we went to South Africa before World Cup, and, and uh, we ran into this, these lions. I couldn't believe it. They're in a watering hole eating, and there's a little baby cub. And while we were there, they looked up and saw us in our Jeep. And so the cub started walking towards us. And the mama lion looked up and saw the cub walking toward us. And she, she signaled the papa lion in the background there and said, you know, get over there. So he got to the back of the truck. She starts coming to the front of the, you know, to the back of the Land Rover. She comes to the front of the Land Rover. And we decided it's probably time to leave. <laughs> but again, she was protective. And that's how we have to be. It was protective of ourselves if we're going to go traveling. So, how can we do that? Well, it depends on where you go, but hepatitis A is something you can get when you travel. It's usually a, a, you know, a mild disease. Humans are the only reservoir of it. It's the one that you usually get from food, you know, contaminated food handlers. And um, there's two brands of, of vaccinations you can have. The key point here is not which brand you get, but that you do need two shots. And they have to be uh, at least six months apart. So you can't plan the week before you go that you got to go get your shots. And, and that's something I did want to bring up about travel is you do have to plan ahead of time for when you're going traveling, especially to parts of the world that have endemic disease. Well, how are you going to know if they have endemic disease? You're going to go to the cdc.gov website, and that can tell you which parts of the world are dangerous and what's recommended in immunizations for that part, those parts of the world. And the shot lasts for 10 to 20 years. We do give hepatitis A shots to children under age two. They usually get, I give mine at age 12 months and 18 months because I don't like to give shots after age 18 months. Kids get big, they, they, can, they can get hurt and the nurse can get hurt giving shots. So I try to get them all in. And it's recommended for travelers or people with kidney or liver failure. You know, hepatitis means inflammation of the liver. And anyone with uh, close contact with international adoptees. You adopt a child from another country, get your shots before you go over to pick them up. Or at risk behavior, like teenagers. And then here's the serious one. This is hepatitis B. This is one you might want to star because this is one that they're starting to say that everyone needs to be immunized. Because over 2 billion people are serologically positive of hepatitis B infection. You know, in China, it's endemic. There's, there's provinces in China where almost everyone is hepatitis B positive. Um, 400 million are chronic carriers. They have this virus. You cannot kill viruses. You can't kill the chickenpox virus. You can't kill the hepatitis virus. 500,000 to 1.2 million every year get cirrhosis or liver failure from hepatitis B. Number one cause of liver transplants. It's not alcohol or trauma or botulism. It's hepatitis B infection kills the liver. Primary prevention. Again, where are we going to get the bang for the buck? Pr 
primary prevention to increase the herd immunity. So by you getting your shots, you also protect the people around you, the people you touch in your herd. And the vaccine is over 90% effective against all the strains of HPV viruses, unlike the influenza. So as we said, it causes bad disease. Liver failure, hepatocellular cancer, another vaccine, another virus that's associated with cancer. Immunity can be measured by just a simple blood test. So if you think that you might have immunity, get it checked. At your next, next exam, ask your doctor to be checked. If you do not have immunity, you can have the shots. But it's a series of three shots, so you got to do it ahead of time if you're going to go traveling. you got to think of it ahead of time. The children, we give them, we used to give hepatitis B shots to kids when they were starting junior high because that was with their risk, at-risk behavior. But this is such a prevalent disease that we, we've, it's now combined in the childhood shots. So they get their shots at two, four, and six months of age. And if the mother is hep B positive, they get a shot right at birth. They get something a little different. So what is the vaccine? They're derived from yeast, so that was interesting, not eggs. And they are mercury free. There's two different kinds. Those are the brand names of the two different kinds. The dosing schedule is about the same. It's at zero, one, and then one is at four months, the other is at six months. And it's recommended for all adults who are exposed to the virus. So that means if you're going traveling, if the kind of behavior ha you have would expose you to hepatitis B, very high in the gay population, AIDS, et cetera, any kind of risk-taking behavior. Occupational, all of us people in the hospital get our hepatitis B shots and we get checked. Renal dialysis centers is another big place, so all, all of the ones there get checked too. It, the protection lasts supposedly 15 to 20 years. Now what we, and that's why I say get your antibody checked, because even if you had the shots, when you were 12, you might not have immunity anymore. And if you d show you know, that you don't have immunity, then you want to have uh, a b one booster shot or low immunity. So last one, the new meningococcal vaccine. This is another vaccine that started out for kids giving to college kids to prevent meningitis. The, so it pre <laughs> And military recruits, those were the ones that actually ha you know, started having the first cases. And it's also, it has a region in Africa. So if you're going to Africa, you should have your meningococcal shot too. It's also required if you're going on a, on, on a Hajj you know, to Mecca. Mecca, the Saudi Arabians require proof of immunization before you can enter Saudi Arabia. And it's recommended also for people who don't have a spleen. Say they were in an auto accident and they lost their spleen, or because of some disease they lost their spleen, then they should have this shot too. There's two kinds, just to let you know. The other one, the MPSV4, is, is recommended for people over age 56 because the other one is only recommended for people through age 55. And if people are at high risk, then they do revaccinate. Otherwise, this is considered a lifetime. So not for healthy adults. So again, my take home message to you is that vaccines are really important because they provide primary prevention. And that's the best opportunity for improving health and lowering healthcare costs.